everyone to look to your left and you're going to text that person every day. And if you text that person every day and you say, how are you today? Is there anything I can do for you? And I want you to know I'm here for you if you need help. If you text that person every day, then on July 30th, you can cash that $500 check. And the stories that came out of that were, I mean, unbelievable. Um, Thank you so much for tuning into Journey with Christian D. Evans Podcast. I'm your host, Christian D. Evans. When you only care about yourself, no one else cares about you. When you care about others, everyone cares about you too. This is our guest motto that he has coined and that that's the reason why I wanted to have him on our podcast. He's the executive chairman and founder of Honors Holding, which is the largest franchise for our Orange Theory. He owns over 140 studios all over globally throughout the United States. He is now building the Sweat House franchise and brand from the ground up and has scaled to own over a dozen already. After years of experiencing dealing with business and work culture, this man has been able to develop strategies for building successful cultures that everyone craves. He is known as the culture cultivator. Please welcome my next guest, executive chairman and founder of Honors Holding, my friend, Jamie Weeks. How are you doing today, Jamie? Hey, Christian. Thanks for having me. That was uh, way too nice of an intro. I, 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 I definitely don't deserve those nice words, but I really appreciate it. Well, Jamie, I, I want to start off really quick with your motto, because I thought that was really, uh, I was listening to your other podcast with John, yep. and when you only care about yourself, no one else cares about you. When you care about others, everyone cares about you too. And I want to ask a little bit about the revelation. At what yeah. point did that become almost like a motto for you that where you realize, okay, this is, this is the importance, and that became like your DNA, and that became your thesis of your life? Yeah, it, it's it's uh it's it's um it's a really personal story. My my mother passed away 12 years ago and I'm 47 so I was 35 with a wife and two kids um working on Wall Street and had spent, you know, the first 12 years of my career working on Wall Street and um I was a really selfish materialistic person. And um you know, when you're in that box um, you don't really see it. And, and I, and I, I use this analogy a lot. We all have friends that have dated someone that they thought they were in paradise and all the friends in the outside the box are like, man, this is not going to end well. This, this is going to be a problem, right? Well, I, I was no different than that. And, and, and the fact that it was just all about money, it was all about me and it was all about what I can have and what I can achieve. And when my mother passed away, I really took, you know, this wasn't an overnight thing. This was, really some, it it takes some vulnerability and self-reflection of sitting down and saying, am I really the person that my mother wanted me to be? And, um, you know, that's evolved over the last 12 years into um, where we're at today, where my focus is culture and other people versus myself and and, and all about Jamie. Again, let me be very clear. I am far from a perfect person in any way whatsoever, right? (laughs) I am, I am no different than anyone else. It's just for me, my focus has turned into caring more about others than I care about myself. And when I, when I realize when you do that, everyone starts to care about you, but when you only care about yourself, people don't have any reason to care about you. And so it's a very simple motto, but it's one that I try to wake up every day and say, this is, this is what I've got to do. Now, let me say this also before you, before we go on, I still wake up and I'm still selfish. I fight being selfish every day, right? Whether it's, um, uh, God, it could be anything. It's just, we all have that struggle and that fight. And for me, it's the fight of me, 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 and want, want, want. And I've also realized that doesn't make me happy. I'm, I'm a, I'm a giver and I love to give gifts and I love, I get more enjoyment out of other people being happy. And I'll tell you, and I Christian, you know, I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts and I'm, I'm willing to bet you've had everyone on your podcast been extremely successful, all the more successful than me. And um, Jordan Peterson says this, and I love this is when he says, be careful who you share good news with, because you're going to really find out who your friends are when you have success and who supports you and rallies around you and builds you up and who just kind of disappears because they don't like you succeeding. And that really goes with the motto of of, uh, caring more about others and care about yourself. And so I get so much enjoyment personally out of other people's success that, man, it's just, it just, you just, it's, it's hard not to be happy when that's your focus. Well, and I appreciate you being authentic and sharing that. And I was going to ask you, because we realize that it, it 
you know, pride and arrogance can come in and it's just humility, right? And you have to work on it daily. Like you just mentioned, that's something you have to work on daily. So let's unpack that a little bit further. What do you do on a daily basis to help you remind yourself to stay on that path, uh, focusing on others? Because it does sneak in and, yeah. you know, definitely with your success and with your achievements and with your brand and, you know, it, it, it you know, it's, it's easy to fall back into yeah. that unless you are very aware and right, you know, in place the right boundaries and systems to ensure you don't. Yeah, what does yeah. that look like? Yeah, you're right. Listen, um, it starts with the hardest thing in the world to do, which is vulnerability. If you have vulnerability, vulnerability is 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 really um, the the mother of progress. It's impossible to progress to have progress without vulnerability. You have got to look yourself in the mirror and say, "Am I being the best version of myself for everyone else? Am I being the best best version of myself for everyone around me?" Am I really caring more about others? It's one thing to ask someone what they did this weekend and and just kind of stand there and act like you're listening. It's a whole nother thing to ask follow-up questions about their weekend, right? I mean, that's that's a real difference, right? So what'd you do this weekend? And they say, oh, I did this, went to the movies, did this. Okay, cool, go on to the next person. No, hold on, what'd you see at the movies? How was it? Who'd you go with? Was it fun? Would you guys do anything after? Like that's, it's 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 next level listening. It's next level vulnerability. And I've learned, and again, you know, I, I want to be, I, I just try to say this as much as possible in the most, with the most humility. I am not perfect. I am not saying this is works for everybody. I'm just saying this is me. And the more vulnerable I get, I mean, think I'm on a podcast with God knows how many thousand listeners talking about how bad and awful I was until my mother passed away. And that made me that, and that's when I started had to get vulnerable, right? That's, that's real vulnerability, right? And so when you have real vulnerability, you're going to start being really honest with yourself. And when you're really honest with yourself, that's when you'll make change. And so do you have accountability partners or mentors that help you ensure that you're not putting on a front, but you destroy that, that front so that you can show up and being vulnerable and authentic? Yeah, it's a really fair question. And I don't, I don't know that it, I would call it accountability partners, but um, I, I, I work with some of my best friends. Uh, one of my best friends is my chief of staff, Sean Nybert, and it's in, 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 in our head of sales at at, um, at honors, Vanessa Vossler. Um, they have no problem calling me out when I'm being a dick. They have no problem saying, hey, I don't know what kind of day you're having today, Jamie, but I'm not a big fan, you know, and and it takes you have to take that. You have to take that and acknowledge it and be like, yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. Right. Um, so. I may not go out and assign accountability partners, but I definitely have them in my friendships with people that have no problem saying, uh, maybe, man, was that, probably shouldn't have said that, Jamie, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, speaking of this, so I want to loop back around at what you mentioned with, with what Jordan Peterson said, because I think this is, I see this a lot where you have successes and a lot of our listeners are maybe first time founders and they're actually doing some really amazing stuff or you know i've had amazing guests that you know had to remove themselves and i'm talking to some of the people that you love the ones that were supposed to be the ones that were beside you you know cheering you on and you you were authentic and vulnerable and said hey this is what's going on this is what's happening in my life and then your heart gets stabbed right intentionally or unintentionally they do that sometimes they say certain things and they plant in these seeds so jamie what how do you approach that and being vulnerable but being uh, dis having discernment with who you're vulnerable with to ensure that, hey, this is a protective or healthy environment, and I know I'm going to get the right feedback in a healthy way. Yeah, I wish it was as black and white as you just said it, right? It never is. And you have to live in the gray. And that's something I talk a lot about is living in the gray and finding your way living in the gray. Because if you can live in the gray and not everything be black and white, um, you're, you're, it's going to be a lot easier to kind of navigate through life, I think. But when I when I had my first sale in December of 2000, 2017 and went through the first process and took on Prospect Hills a partner. I lost friends after that. Um, that was a big deal to me, right? I mean, that was a life-changing event for me and my family. And I lost friends. And then guess what? I had another sale in February of 2022. And guess what? Lost friends. And so um, you really start to discover when you start having um, success, and success can be defined in a lot of different ways. I'm not defining six. I used to define success by selling a business for God knows how much. I now define success by happiness and just and just how happy are those people, right? And so um, I think when you go through and you start having success, it just, when Jordan Peterson said that, it meant a lot to me because I immediately resonated with it. And I lost a really good friend this year when I had success again. And that person would never admit it. That person would never say it, but it's just so obvious. It's just so obvious that 
um, that's what happens at times. And so um, you, you, your, your, your close knit group of friends gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And you kind of in the 20, in your twenties and thirties, you have 30 friends and you just kind of go through life. And, and one night you're with this group and next night you're with this group and you're kind of doing whatever. And then I think in your late thirties and forties, you start kind of narrowing it down to those three, four, five, six people who you have common interests with. They care about you more than they care about themselves. You care about them or you care about yourself. And you get so much satisfaction out of that close knit friendship group that you just don't need the other 30. Well said, well said, you know, and I'm curious when you were going through this journey of really pivoting toward, you know, um, humbling yourself in this regard, being authentic, being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like that has helped you with building the synergistic cultures? Because that's what you're known for is amazing cultures that you've been able to build in a lot of your your verticals yep. of your businesses. Yep. So yep. how do you feel like that has helped? Uh, we don't lose people. We don't lose people. And that allows me to scale. I mean, that, that the, the, the thing I love about culture is it's a two-way street. Um, let me say this differently. It's one road going two different paths. Ready? One path is the culture. If you have a great culture, it's a lot of fun. And you go to work and you have a lot of fun. The second part of it is when I don't lose people, I can scale 10 times faster. Because... If I have a home office of 40 people and no one's leaving, I'm not losing people. And if I'm not losing people, huh, I'm not having to retrain people. And we and, and our businesses we run are simple businesses. Orange Theory is not a difficult business. Sweat House is a very simple business. It's 1,500 square feet. It's six employees. This is not difficult. Dogtopia is a difficult business. That's 25 employees. That's 6,000 square feet. That's, that's 100 dogs with not having opposable thumbs that can't text me and tell me what's going on. Right. <laughs> Sweat house members, orange theory members, they text me all the time, tell me how bad I am or how, how awful things are and we can fix it. Right. Um, so when, when you have a great culture, um, you have a lot of fun and people are happy and, and, and that's amazing. And I love that, but I'm the other big part of it, man, I can scale, I can keep going. But if I have 50% turnover and I have to retrain 20 of my 40, every 18 months, it's really hard to scale. It's really hard to go fast. And so when I, when I really became an entrepreneur in 2014, I think culture was 10 to 20% of my thought process. Culture is now probably 80 to 90% of my thought process, because I know if I get the culture stuff, right, everything else is going to fall into place. Is it, yeah, hey, Peter, is it, is it perfect? No. Do people leave? Yes. I, I don't. I don't want anyone to think that I'm on here talking about that I have a perfect model and perfect business. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying though, um, at Honors Holdings, we went through the pandemic and uh, we paid every employee, part-time employees, full-time employees, 900 employees. We paid everyone. The Oregon Studios were closed for nine or ten months, and part-time employees got their average paycheck of the previous year. We paid every employee. So think about this. So we reopen. And we're in the hardest labor market that we've ever had. And guess who didn't have to hire anybody? That's what culture does. That's what culture does. And as a boutique fitness company, I went into the pandemic with 72 studios. I came out of the pandemic in um, April of 21 with 142 studios or 131 studios. Um, uh, I had my, myself and Jeff Teske, who's my true mentor in this business and, and in the private equity world, who's the best of the best. Um, he called me December of 2020 and said, I got an idea that you are going to hate. And when I say, Jamie, you're going to hate this idea, like you're going to think I'm the dumbest person in the world. And I'm like, OK, I can't wait to hear this. Let's hear it, bro. And he goes, um, we're going to go borrow some money and, and buy a bunch of studios. And I go, that's the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. I don't know if we're going to live. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to live and you want me to go borrow money. And he goes, I know, I know. Sleep on it. Let's talk tomorrow. And he was right. He was that was that was that was when we were supposed exactly what we were supposed to do. And so we went out to market and I raised a hundred million dollars, which was even crazier. It was supposed to be 25. And I was like, what are we doing? You're killing me, bro. You're killing me. I cannot do this. And we did it. We went and bought a bunch of studios. And in hindsight, it was the right thing to do. And that's again, goes back to one of my other philosophies is that I want to be on the other side of the boat. When everyone, when the herd's on one side of the boat, I want to be on the other side of the boat as fast as possible. And that's that. I don't think you can be more opposite than that. We have to be, I don't know if we are, but we have to be the only boutique fitness company out there that doubled their studios during the global pandemic. 
Well, you have to be un unorthodox in the way you think about it. That's why I was listening to that story. And I thought, wow, that's incredible what you did. And, uh, you know, I I'd love to unpack that here shortly. But what I want to ask you a little bit about the culture side of things and what you're able to build is I love how you focus on that. And but you also build it's, it's you've got really clear on what you want to represent and how you want to represent. It. There are certain things I listen to on your other podcast that you actually did very strategically with your with your with your employees, I'd love for you to just share uh, with our audience a few things that you you did that were at a very micro level. That wasn't like part of the job description, if you will, quote unquote. But it was something that was going to add value to everybody's life. And it, I thought it was really interesting. You did like a, you, were, you wrote a check to five for five hundred dollars, and mm -hmm. then you you asked them that you know do certain yeah. things. So um, that was share a, that with our that audience. Was, that, yeah, that's a, a really emotional story, a really amazing story. But I I bought a studio. I bought a studio in Charleston, South Carolina. And um, uh, it was a typical fitness studio, headshots of the coaches, employees on the walls. It was just all ego, all beauty. I mean, if you if you weren't a nine out of 10, it was hard to walk in there because it was just the most beautiful group of people ever anywhere that only cared about themselves, right? Really good hearted people. Some of these people still work for me. Amazing hearted people, but it was just being done in a way that was all about the looks. And so um, I, I got into that studio, we did a team meeting, we got everyone together. And I said, how do I, how do I get them to focus on other people? And I said, okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to use uh, round numbers here, but it's July 1st. And I wrote everyone a check for $500 and I postdated it July 30th. And I said, um, I need everyone to look to your left and you're going to text that person every day. And if you text that person every day and you say, how are you today? Is there anything I can do for you? And I want you to know I'm here for you if you need help. If you text that person every day, then on July 30th, you can cash that $500 check. And the stories that came out of that were, I mean, unbelievable. Um, a couple employees that said that never had someone text them every day telling them they care about them. Um, we had an employee that was having a really, really down on her luck, tough time. And those texts created a conversation, mm -hmm. which then created a whole nother conversation, which created then, hey, listen, we've got to get some help. We got to, we, uh, you know, we've got a mental health issue before it was mental health, right? Before that was the, the hot thing to talk about. Um, and so you, you start really discovering who you are as a human and who someone else is and learning about them when you start doing things like that. And so that was just another thing, trying to think outside the box to force people to care about other people. Um it's, it's tough to do. It's tough to do. And we've had, a, we've had employees leave us um, because it was all about them. And, and it is what it is. You know, I just, it's hard to get in the fitness industry, people to care about others, but it honors and really at Orange Theory, Orange Theory, the one of the things I love about Orange Theory is that it is for all people. I mean, it's truly for all people. You can run on that treadmill, you can power walk, you can do anything. And so we just kind of took it to another level. What I think is so interesting about that story specifically and why I thought it was so impactful is because we've seen culture as like a, the, the sexy word, word, right, for, for 2020, you know, whatever, this, this last few years. And it, there's like this fictitious culture where it's like, hey, we've got games, we got all this fun, exciting things and, you know, whatever. But there's also that internal, that DNA, that deep empathetic, emotional culture, right? Which is kind of what you build. And you said, hey, you know, I didn't really just going out of your way to add value to someone. And then how does that make that person feel? They feel collected, they feel part of something bigger than themselves. And that's why I thought it was really interesting how you intentionally thought of that. Where did you come up with that idea? And how did you decide, hey, this is this is how I want Orange Theory, our family, our, our unit, our business yeah. to represent? You know, I, I I don't I don't have an answer for that, Christian. I don't know where I came up with it. It was kind of in the moment. It was it was um and Michael Mayer, who was my first hire at honors, who's our COO today, could probably tell you you know more about it. But I it, it just um at, at the crux of everything, Christian, we're human beings. <laughs> That's it. We're just human beings. And we got one chance. We got one chance to do this right, and we got one chance to be happy. And you get to wake up every morning and choose happiness. Every morning you get to wake up and choose happiness. And I know that sounds a lot easier than it is. I completely get it. But when you start getting into this positivity mindset and you start getting into manifesting your own happiness and making choices based on your happiness, you won't believe what will happen, but you have to do it and you have to be vulnerable about it. You have to say, hey, I'm not happy doing this, or I'm not happy with this person, or I'm not happy with this. And 
Listen again, and I, I don't want anyone to think I'm a major Jordan Peterson fan. I mean, I, I I do think he says some amazing things. I also think he says some things that are just <laughs> kooky, right? Uh, but he he's right, and and a lot of podcasts, and a lot of thought leaders right now are talking about you've got to cancel friendships sometimes. Sometimes that friendship is not what's best for you, and it's not making you happy, but you think you have to be in it. And I think it starts there, tr- just choosing your own happiness and going from there. I don't know where I came up with the idea, but I knew we had to do something to get that studio focused on other people rather than themselves. I'm curious, was there a, um, was it like a monetary or what was the result that you saw? Not just, you know, culturally and synergistically, but maybe, maybe even deeper as well. Just saw like maybe the, the energy of that, that specific location was like higher. And maybe you saw because of that, there was more like morale behind it and, you know, Go, you know, go out of the way to support their their teammates. And I mean, what, what are the things did you see because of implementing that one thing? Yeah. So we have, we use Listen360 for our net promoter scores for our NPS. And so that's, I, I think I'm hoping a lot of your listeners will know what that is, but you know, you get a, as a member at Orange Theory, and we do it at Sweat House and Dollartopia as well. You get a survey, you know, probably every couple months. What do you think? How do you like the studio? What's good? What's bad? What, you know, all the things. And that's really kind of telling you your, your business plan going forward, right? Well, uh, those Listen360 scores are what I look at every day. First thing I look at every morning. And for me, um, what we saw, not for me, but what we saw in those studios immediately is the NPS scores went up. And it was because all of a sudden the coaches and the staff were focused on the members rather than themselves. Who doesn't love to be cared for? Who doesn't love the attention on them? Well, we're in the service business. I mean, we want to say we're a fitness company. We're in the service business, a little bit of the therapy business as well, right? Because we're creating these endorphins. We're giving you stuff to be happy. No one wants to work out. I mean, if you do want to work out every day, I mean, probably like a serial killer. If you want to work out seven days a week, let's just be honest, right? Uh, but, 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 you know, for those of us that wish we could work out seven days a week, but probably do the four or five, um, you know, I, I, it, nothing feels better than the, for the focus to be on you. And um, that's what our focus is at Orange Theory, at Sweat House, at Dogtopia. We have to make it about other people. And the result of that are your NPS scores. And so at or- at Honors, we have the highest NB- NPS scores in, in the system. And I would say in Boutique Fitness, our NPS scores are probably the highest in the industry. On a 90-day rolling average, we're at a 91% approval for all 142 studios. That's incredible. That is remarkable. Just to see how you do you implement that micro on, thing. But we compensate on that NPS score. I mean, that is a driver in, we see it. Like when we see an NPS score go from 91 to 83 to 80 to 79 to 77, that manager or, or coach has most likely checked out. They're looking for other jobs. They're not involved. They're not making about other people. It's It's a... Uh, every NPS score that I've seen go from 90 to 70s, that manager is most likely quit, left, or we fired within 90 days of that. And then when we see a new manager take it from 75 to 91, 92, 93, that's a person that's so focused on other people that they're going to crush it. They're going to crush it. Well, what I think is so interesting, the way you analyzed that was like, okay, hey, in order to you know, to increase this number, right? You didn't go, okay, we're going to go ahead and start implementing these SOPs and the, the way to say things and the sales process. It was more of like that micro thing, which is what you mentioned, talking about culture, which led and, and like just sprinkled throughout the whole organization, this amazing energy, and that directly affected the MPI score. And I think that's why it's so important to have this conversation uh, and this dialogue. I want to ask you a little bit regarding uh, Sweat House a little bit. I want to pivot toward this. Sweat House is on the on the front end of this kind of market, and it hasn't hit mass market, mass scale yet in regards to awareness of these kind of services. But what's noticing is that it's hitting the it's it's going the right direction. People are becoming more aware of it, where it's mm-hmm. becoming more like more accessible, like obviously Sweat House. And what I find interesting is there's been a lot of scientific evidence to show the the, the importance, the power behind this these services. I want to ask before we dive into Sweat House and what it, what it provides. How did you guys decide to get into this? What were you looking at at a macro level? Were you seeing, okay, the no. trends, the market, the, the you know, just it was, it was growing and year over year growth. What did you see to say, okay, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start pivoting and add Orange Theory, but also add Sweat House that allowed us to really take a nice position in this yeah. uh, emerging market? So Christian, uh, 99% of the people you have in your podcast will give you an amazing answer because they're really, really smart. I am not really, really smart. (laughs) I am an absolute idiot. 
<laughs> and I decided in November of 2019, listen, I, I, um, I've been in failed businesses also. Let's be very, very clear. Okay. This is not a success story. This is a, I, I tell people that I am the definition of trial and error with a little less error every year. I mean, that's, if you think about it, life is trial and error. Life is trial and error. And at 22, you make a shit ton of errors. At 47, I'm making less errors. Life is trial and error. And so for me, Sweat House was a trial and error. And um, I had a space next to an Orange Theory here in Atlanta that was open. And I said, you know, that's a good space. We ought to try this infrared sauna thing. And so um, we, I, I sold 80% of honors to Prospect Hill in December of 2017. Um, I've got a couple board members, uh, Bill Watts and Joe Fortunato. Joe Fortunato is the chairman of Sprouts. Bill Watts is the former chairman of GNC and Mattress Firm. These guys are in their late 60s, early 70s. They are the smartest people I've ever met in my life. They have forgotten more than I'll ever know. Um, you can tell by my personality. I'm a big personality and kind of always going nonstop. Uh, so I, I love to say that they, you know, these, um, uh, I hope they don't kill me for saying this. Our board is made up of Prospect Hill, and then they're the operating partners, and they are like me. They're the gamblers in the room, right? And there's like me, Bill, and Joe who are like, yeah, let's just do that. Let's just do that. Let's just do that. And then Jeff and Kyle and those guys are like, let's, can we talk about this for a second? And, and I'm just like, no, let's go. Let's go. We'll figure it out. It's trial and error. We'll figure it out, right? And so so we we, we I sell uh, honors in December 17 and December of 2017, and, and Joe Fortunato is like, you know, Jamie, you're you're a young guy. I mean, this is, this is, I was like, yeah. He's like, what are you going to do? I was like, I, I'm going to keep running honors, but I want to stay in this franchise world. And he was like, okay. I said, you know, I'd like to, I said, I'd like for my first step to be Dogtopia. He's like, well, talk to Jeff about it. And so I talked to Jeff. I said, Hey, listen, I'm going to run honors day to day, but would you be okay if I were to become a franchisee in Dogtopia? And um, thank God he said, yes. And he said, I'm okay with it, but can you keep us in the loop on everything? And I said, absolutely. I'm completely transparent. I won't hide anything from you. And so I did that and we started getting that going. And then I said, to him, hey, listen, I got this other idea. It won't be big, I promise. I just want to do a couple of these. I think there's something there. Let me figure it out. And he was like, I'm okay with it, but you got to keep me in the loop. I said, I promise I'll keep you in the loop. And so we opened our first sweat house, which we named it, and uh, in Vinings in, um, in, two, in November of 2019. And it was an unlimited membership for $99. And it was just infrared saunas. And um, we had decent marketing and just kind of people started coming in and we did some revenue. And I was like, this is, this actually may work, you know? So, so we opened another one in January of 2020. I don't know if you could have worse timing in the world. Um, I used to say, you know, opening this business in January, 2020 was the worst timing until I opened a Dogtopia, uh, March 16th of 2020 in Portland, Oregon. That is without a doubt, the worst timing in the worst city that you could ever choose in the history of the earth. Um, it's worked out long-term. And so um, we opened a Sandy Springs sweat house and just infrared saunas. And when we reopened May 15th in the pandemic here in Georgia, um, we got an influx of members and we started talking more and more about what we should do. And then I started opening a couple more and it was just infrared saunas. And um, I, I, I was, ha I was, I thought we were having success. And uh, to me, success was, we're making money. I mean, we have a new business and we're making money and this makes sense. And I started getting some private equity phone calls of people saying, Hey, listen, what, you, what are you doing? What's your plan? And I just kept saying, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. And then um, I had a couple of private equity firms fly out to Atlanta and look at it. And I had a couple make me offers. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for that now. And then we got about 10 of them open or maybe I'm sorry, six of them open with like four or five more leases. And um, we had a firm that said, Hey, we want to buy it. And uh, they made a they made a pretty strong offer, and I sent it to Prospect Hill and said, "What do you want me to do?" And they said, "Let's let's we need to wrap this up." I'm getting to a point here, Christian. And 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 uh, they said, "Can we do a consumer survey?" And I said, "Absolutely." So we did a member survey, and the member survey came back, and this was in uh, this was in December of twenty um, December of twenty one, and the member survey came back, and it said, "We love Sweat House. We wish you did more." We wish there was more offerings. And that was my path immediately to a cold plunge because I really wanted to be hot and cold. I really saw the benefits there. Wasn't really sure how I was going to figure out how to get revenue from a cold plunge, something you're in water that recycles every six minutes for three minutes. I mean, 
how much can I really charge for that? And then I said, well, you don't, you make it part of the membership. And so we added that and people loved it. And then we've added hydro massage and red light therapy. And um, so it's, it's turned into um, what you're saying is, yeah, we're in the really early stages of this, but this, this is going to be, um, I'm saying this on a re- recorded podcast. So this is definitely going to come back and bite me. This will be much bigger than anything I've ever done. It'll be much bigger than honors. Um, and, and it's, it's pretty cool to watch. We're having a lot of fun. That was a really long winded story. I'm sorry, Christian. No, Jamie. And I really appreciate unpacking that because it's, it's the serendipities. And I also appreciate your humility in regards, to like you didn't look at the, the market possibility and year over year growth and okay massive whatever and you're like okay we're going all in on this because we see the next you know you know kit caboodle but the reality is just like hey let's go for it because like hey you know you're you're an action taker and let's you know figure it out on the way but it's interesting how it has evolved into this because i am seeing massive i mean uh high net worth ultra high net worth individuals i've talked to and a lot of business owners they're seeing the benefits of it a lot of medical research has come out in regards to obviously the benefits of the the hot and cold strategy and we're, we're talking you know like more naturopathic ways right so it's like instead of having to be reactive this yep. is proactive yep. uh, even sleeping patterns sleeping habits you know getting in that focus state a lot of uh, very well-known athletes so Jamie, I'm curious with your strategy when you're deploying this, um, because I'm not too familiar with it, uh, Sweat House. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I understand that, you know, it's a franchise locations, experience, et cetera. But when you guys are deploying this to go to market, are you guys going targeting more of like that, you know, um, higher end individual kind of uh, that that's able to afford that, that's able to have those like extra luxuries a little bit? Or is it more of like, what's your thesis to ensure, hey, how are we maximizing our growth? And then obviously you'll hit mass market, which is kind of that middle income where, okay, hey, maybe we can or cannot afford this, but we're going to find a way. What does that look like? Yeah, another great question. And it's one of those things where um, it's trial and error right now. I, I don't think this is just high-end luxury for everybody. I mean, I think this is for everybody. I don't think this is just for Buckhead, Georgia. I think this is for everybody. And this is not a crazy price point. I mean, this is an unlimited membership for 149 and you get unlimited cold plunges, um, unlimited infrared saunas, um, hydro massage you, and, and red light therapy. I think you get two or three a month. So this is this is not a crazy price point for what you're getting and the, and the medical benefits of it, right? Um Every suite has a vitamin C shower. You have towel service with it as well. Uh, you have live TV, Hulu live TV in each one of these. So you can sit there, you can meditate, you can decompress, you can listen to music. The key to it is getting in there for 30 minutes and, and sweating for 30 minutes really hard, getting those toxins, getting those metals out of your body, getting that glow. You feel like a new person. And then, you know, if you're up to it, hopping in that cold plunge at, at 50, 47, 50 degrees for three minutes, you know, that's some of the other stuff stuff that's coming out is that the benefits of cold plunge are not for longer is better. It's really 11 minutes a week and a cold plunge total is where the real peak benefit is. And so you're talking about doing it for three or four minutes, three times a week. It's not that awful. I'll tell you um, from someone who is an endorphin junkie, I love endorphins as much as any person. You'll never get endorphins the way you get from a cold plunge. Never. I don't care what you're, well, I shouldn't say that. There's some guys going to be like, I did this, I get more, whatever. Right. I'm just saying for me personally, the endorphins I get after I three or four minute cold plunge at 47 degrees is just, it's off the charts. You're going to get people yelling at me. It should be colder. It should be this. You should go longer. I get it, whatever. I'm just telling you what worked for me. And I'm telling you what works for our members that also um, is that three or four minutes for, for, uh, for at 47 degrees. We did in the month of December with 12 studios, we did over 4,000 cold plunges in December. I mean, it, there was a day in Atlanta in December, it was six degrees and people cold plunged. I'm like, what are you doing? Just go outside. You don't need to cold plunge. Just go on your back porch. You're going to, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Um, so it's, it's, there's something there and it's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, the way we're doing the franchise is um, I'm doing multi-unit only. I'm doing the opposite of most franchisors. We're making about multi-unit. Um, we're going to build 30, 40, 50 corporate studios. We're using the corporate studios for our franchisees to pull employees from. Um, it's almost like a, a training ground for employees and managers. And so when, so I've got a, a, um, a studio that's opening down in Boca sometime in March or April, and he's interviewing managers right now of our current corporate studios to see if we can get one of those to move down there and open that studio. What? How many franchisors do that? No one does that. 
No one does that. But I want to put that on us. We can go hire more managers and get them set up and get them running faster and going faster. And then the other thing we're doing that's a lot of uh, really opposite of a lot of franchisors is that when you buy a territory, we're giving you a rofer on remaining territory around it as well for 12, 18, or 24 months. Because what I don't want to have is a city like Atlanta with 10 franchisees. You need to have one. That's how they can get scale. That's how they can sell that business and monetize it one day. That's how it you, you keep that... You know, if I have 30, 40, 50 franchisees with a thousand locations, they're going to benefit from that more than anybody. And that's what we got to build. I like where you're coming from in that regard. And what's interesting about this kind of thesis is the 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 knowledge or education is already out there. So it's not like you have to convert them and you know, educate them on this new way of doing something. A lot of people are very somewhat familiar with it. They've seen a lot of actors. They've seen a lot of you know, athletes, like I mentioned, that are leveraging a lot of this to get to, to that peak performance. Um, and, and that's why I think it's so interesting. Now, I am also intrigued because if you look at anybody's business, there's always that cost to acquire customer, but also that lifetime value, but also increasing yeah. the, the, the average you know, client value of that individual. And I know Planet Fitness kind of thesis and, and uh, you know, um, Planet, uh, Active Planet or all these different, you know, kind of gyms, if you will, they all have their own little thesis to be able to increase that, that, that long term, right, that average cart. Um, what is your strategy to be able to say, is it, is it more of a quantity game in that regard? Because it's only 149 uh, you know, lifetime. What does that look like in regards to like other ways? Are you going to add like other chambers in there to be able to say, hey, this is extra service on top of it that could be additional uh, that would be beneficial? Yeah, another really good question. Wow, I was not prepared for these good questions, Christian. I mean that sincerely. Um, so I'm going to go back to this statement. You're talking to the greatest C, D plus student of your entire life. Like there's no one that can make more C's than me, the best by far. I mean, I did as little as possible to get through life for as long as possible. And so I like really simple businesses and an infrared sauna, cold plunge and hide massage, red light therapy is really all we need. I mean, we're about to announce a major partnership with a, um, a percussion therapy um, business. There's only two big ones out there, you know, hype right and, and their body. So you can pick one of those, but we're about to implement that in our studios as well and be a major partner for them with them as well. And I'm excited about that. We'll announce that in February, but we've already done the deal. Um, and so I don't want to confuse this business. I don't want to make it more difficult than it is in any way whatsoever. I just want to keep it right where it is because I think what will help drive this business is the awareness and the growth of that market and that segment over the next 10, 20 years, it's not going to get smaller. It's only going to get bigger. And so I need to keep this as simple as possible. We have a, a, another business that's a competitor of ours, and I don't want to say their name because I think they're a great business, but they've got a really big menu and it's a lot of things to choose from. And that creates um, confusion. And so I think what Orange, what I've learned from Orange Theory and Dogtopia, two of the best out there, I mean, Dave Long, who's one of my closest friends, and, and Neil Gill at Dogtopia is amazing. These are franchisors I've learned a ton from. They are keeping their business really simple. And there's a lot to be said for that. And so we're going to do the same thing. I can't imagine us adding any other modalities anytime soon. Um, I will say this. Uh, I do. We do own the name um, Penthouse by Sweathouse. And so what we may do is we may create, I've got it in like that Beverly Hills uh, Hilton um, uh, font as well. It looks amazing. I love it. Um, uh, we may do something there where we have 10 suites and all 10 suites have each modality in the suite. So you may have a four person sauna, a cold plunge and a hydro massage red light therapy in that room with the, with a double shower to where you could have three or four people in there that could be rotating around those and they rent the room. We, we may do something like that. Um, but I can't imagine us adding other modalities because I just don't think we need it right now. Well, I really love this approach and this paradigm. First of all, Jamie, you're really humble and I really appreciate that big time. You know, even though you got to see you're, you're very, 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 you've done very well for yourself. Thank but you. I love this, the, the concept and the paradigm, the mindset of simplicity. Where did that come from? Was that just yourself? Because that has been your approach. And I've heard this on other podcasts that you've done where that has been like your thesis throughout your life. It's like, hey, I'm going to take something that's complicated, bring it down to simplification. Because mm -hmm. like you mentioned, I've, I was listening to uh, the owner of, um, 
uh, five guys. And that's, that's their thesis. It's like, Hey, this is it. This is all you get. We don't have a bajillion different things. This is, this is it. And then they've been able to scale at very, very high level in UK and all over I, the world. I, so. I, I bet the best restaurants you've ever been to have one of two things, a limited menu, or there's only two items that you like, <laughs> right? Like I think of uh, my, my favorite sushi restaurant in the world is actually here in Atlanta, a place called Umi. And to me, it's, it's just, I love it. And I've been to amazing. I'm a, I'm a sushi guy. I love sushi. And so I, I'll, if anyone, um, if you want to weigh to my heart, I need someone to DM me your favorite sushi location in a city. And I'm telling you right now, I will go to it. Like I'm dying to start a diner's drive-ins dives of just sushi. Cause I mean, that is, that is my dream. And so I think about that and they have a massive menu but there are like five items that I go to every time and that's what I get and I'm happy and I don't need more. Um, there is a restaurant down on, on 30A in the beach that has like five items every night and that's all they have. That's their whole menu. It's been the same for 15 years. So I don't, I don't need to, to reinvent the wheel. And so simplicity wins. Simplicity uh, makes sense to members and clients as well. When you give people a lot of choices, they struggle. People want to be told what to do. And when you have a very simple menu, it makes it very easy to make decisions. And so I want people to have um, to have the ability to make really quick, easy decisions. And I think that's part of having a limited menu. I love that. I love that thesis and, and that paradigm because I see so many people. I, I was looking at uh, one business I was working with. And I mean, they were they were trying to measure at a very micro level, uh, like attribution for all these campaigns. And I'm like, let's just simplify the crap out of it. And it's just like, there's was, there was a lot of this, there's a lot of validation behind the simplicity of a business. And I appreciate you kind of reemphasizing that for our audience because we always love to act like, and again, pride and arrogance, we like to overcomplicate and think, oh, this is what we're going. There's all this fun stuff we're doing. So, um, Jamie, I want ask in regards to when you were when you were looking to um, sell a portion of your business on our holdings in 2017 what was that thought process um, because obviously you've done very well for yourself what was that kind of because some of our audience they they're in a situation where they have that conversation with themselves about like exiting and at what point should they exit at what point should they take you know some chips off the table and kind of reposition yep. and do something different uh, how did you come to that conclusion well, I've, I've always had an investment philosophy that um, uh, you, you've just you've got to you've got to take care of um, yourself and your team first. And the way that we do that is is we compensate very well, but at the same time, um, uh, everyone at LFC is an owner in the business. At Honors, we've got two hundred people of the fifteen hundred employees that have equity in that business. Um, that's a big deal. And, you know, I, I can't ask someone to act like an owner if they're not an owner. I mean, that's just bullshit, right? So if you're going to, if you're going to talk to me and act and then and ask me to act like, like an owner, then compensate me like an owner, make me feel like a part of it. And so that's a, that's a real big deal. And so um, I'm, I'm a fan of building things and then selling them, but rolling and continuing to do it over and over and over and build it and get better. I, I need the help of a private equity firm. They, um, Jeff Teske and, and Kyle Casella have helped me become uh, a CEO that I am today. There's no way I do this without their guidance. And, and obviously the board, Bill Watts and Joe Fortunato. Um, and they've, you know, I've had difficult discussions with them where they're giving me uh, constructive criticism. And it's not easy to hear, but I got to, I got to get it. You know, I got to have that to get better. And so, uh, and then you also, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide rolls out, right? You go through a global pandemic. You don't know really what you got as a partner until you go through a global pandemic together. And thank God I, I was with them. And so I'm just a, a big fan of taking some chips off the table about every two, three, four years in every business and, and, and kind of continuing that cycle and moving on. Is right or wrong i don't know you know could i have, there's no way i could have scaled honors to where it is today without their help um there's no way i could scale sweat house and dogtopia without their help um it's a lot more pressure when you're doing it on your own you know i, I all these businesses i had no debt i funded them myself uh the honors holdings for 14 from 2014 to 2017 i was using my savings to build these i didn't do it with debt and i'm not saying that to brag i'm saying it to, to say hey listen i i put my money where my mouth was and, you know, Reagan, my wife, by the middle of 2017, she was like, hey, listen, uh, just a heads up, um, what are you doing? And are we going to be okay? And I'm like, I got it. I promise I got it. I think. I think I got it. But I, I promise. I think I got it. And so, uh, so you know, it's, 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 you, just, you just never know, right? You never know. But, but I'm a risk taker. I like taking risk. I like taking bets on myself. You know, I'm not a stock investor. I can't control it. 
I like bonds and CDs. I like treasuries. I don't, I, you know, if I can't control the risk, I don't want to take it. But if, but if I can control the risk and I, I can be a part of it, dude, I'm all in. Let's do it. Let's roll up the shades. Let's roll some dice. Let's go. You got to have some of that, by the way. Well, you got to, if you don't have, yeah. you don't have the fortitude to say, Hey, I'm all in. Let's go. Let's go ahead and make a big bet. Then it's hard to have that reward. So let me ask you this because you, you, during the pandemic, you had that friend and I forget his name, but he came up to me, came up to you and said, Hey, you know what? We're going to go ahead and take out some of this debt. We're yeah, going to take some of this. And yeah. This, yeah. This was after this, uh, you know, selling portion of your holding, uh, you know, yeah, this, this is December of 2020. So, so in December of 2020. Yeah. Mid pandemic. What was that? What was that thought process? You know, because obviously, and, and how did you structure this to think that way? Because it's like, yes, you see the opportunity, yeah. but also you want to make sure that the risk is like, hey, if if this doesn't succeed, if we anticipate that yeah. we have no users, we how can we still afford this? Yeah. And what is our runway? So what yeah. was that thought process? So if you think about uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, if you were an investor then, and in 2000 and let's say, I think the market bottomed in what, February of 2009, when it felt the worst. If you went all in on real estate in February of 2009, do you know how much money you made the next 10 years? I mean, it was astronomical, astronomical. And so, but that was the opposite of what everyone's doing. There was no one, there were a few billionaires who were like, February 2009, let's go all in. Let's just start buying as much real estate as we can. We're going to crush it. And they were right. And so when it feels like the worst time to invest, it's actually the best. And when it feels like the best time to invest, it's actually the worst. And so Bitcoin at $60,000 felt like it was going to a million and it was the best time to invest. How's that feel today, right? And Bitcoin at you know, who I don't know where it is today, 16,000 Bitcoin. I don't have any crypto, by the way. I'm not, I'm, I'm just saying like that feeling of when it feels the worst, it's usually the best. And when it feels the best, it's usually the worst. Can you imagine taking a hundred million dollars in December of 20 or in April of 21 and saying, I'm all in on boutique fitness? No one would do that. That's the dumbest idea in the world. And here we are going into 2023 and, you know, we'll have a two-year anniversary this April of us taking that money. And I got a feeling Boutique Fitness is about to go on a pretty good run over the next three years. Because I've, I've heard this strategy, and this is why I'm so intrigued with, and I want to get your perspective on this, because I'm a big believer in being aggressive with everybody when there's blood in the streets, right? That concept. But also you have to think about it like, okay, I want to play the long game. And I'm willing to play the long game, but you also have to mitigate that loss because if if you don't have enough dry powder to withstand that that period of time where you're not bringing any revenue, sometimes that money's got to come somewhere, right? Hey, you know the rent, the vacancy, whatever it may be. Yeah. And so, how do you guys look at that? It's like, okay, hey, we're gonna go ahead and take some, uh, you know, five million dollars. We're gonna go ahead and get 15, 20, yeah. uh, you know, positions. Yeah. With that, we understand that we can basically have a good run rate a runway for each one of those locations for 12 months, 18 months with no users, with no income coming in. Is that how you think about it? Or what, what is that like kind of yeah, understanding well, to be able to know, say, Hey, I am anticipating yeah. where the market's going. What does yeah, that look like? Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, again, another really good question. Um, so it was pretty interesting in December of, in December of, of 20, we had been open in um, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee. And so uh, we were seeing people come back in those states and we were seeing members come back and we were hearing members saying, I miss this so much. I have to have this. I can't believe I didn't have Orange Theory yet. And so it gave us, it gave me a good feeling that, hey, listen, this is not going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. And it gave us that feeling of, hey, this is not going to last forever. Things are going to get better. We're going to come out on the other side of this. So that was a big part of it, right? Remember, I wasn't taking this bet in April of 2020 when I was wiping down groceries being delivered to my house, right? <laughs> um, but we were making this bet in, in, in April of 21, a year after that, when I said, that was actually probably the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life is wiping down the toilet paper being delivered to my house. Um, <laughs> let's just, let's think about that for a second. Um, so, you know, uh, to, to me, um, uh, this business, the honors business, Orange Theory business, um, when things are really good, it's a really good profitable business. And so we were at a point where we were ready to see, we saw a bit of, of good news on the horizon and we were buying stuff at multiples that were less than what they were in the previous three or four years. 
And so um, the upside made a lot of sense. Obviously, we did the math on it and looked at it and said, you know, if this doesn't come back until um, mid-22, end of 22, we're still going to be okay. Um, and But we have, we have states today that are at 120% of where they were of March 2020. And we have states that are at 65% of where they were March 2020. And luckily, we have more that are at 100% than they're at 65%. Um, and so, you know, I think this bet will play out over time and we'll see how this plays out uh, long term. But at the end of the day, Christian, um, if you want to have big reward, you got to make some pretty big bets. And uh, we know that business. I know that business really well. We as a company know that business really well. We knew what we could do. And I didn't think fitness was going to die forever. And so I think we're going to be in our, I think honors and orange theory is in a, in a place that's going to be an amazing comeback story over the next 24 months, an amazing comeback story. I think boutique fitness, let me just make, let me, I mean, actually, let me make a bigger state. I think boutique fitness is going to have a, an enormous resurgence over the next 24 months, unlike any other. And I think big box has already seen it. Big box is going to keep seeing it. Well, I appreciate you explaining that. And I'm, I'm excited to see that. And I love having people like yourself that do take big back bets on this, on this kind of strategy and it helps me understand kind of how you think about it, because I'm a big believer in being aggressive during this time. And, but you also have to make sure that you have the right boundaries and the disciplines to ensure that you can obviously, you know, play that long game because that long game, you see the, the massive, massive, I mean, we've seen that numerous 2008, 2009. I remember Bill, um, uh, Warren Buffett deployed a lot of capital and a lot of different banks. And during that time, I mean, seven, eight years later, uh, billions upon billions upon billions of dollars worth, but you had to play that long game and you had to, you know, obviously mitigate that risk a little bit and ensure that you had enough dry powder to ensure that you were able to play that. And I think that's yeah. where I've seen a lot of individuals where they, they got too aggressive during this last year with the real estate market and they've, they've over leveraged now. And now they're sitting there like, Oh crap, what's happening. And because you're seeing vacancy rates and all sorts of things that are going on. So it's just interesting. So if you don't play it, you play it correctly. And that's why I appreciate you just explaining your thought process, the way you looked at it, Jamie, man, I appreciate you being on here. I also appreciate your humility and I'm glad you're wiping down those, those, that toilet paper before you used it. <laughs> but uh, Jamie, um, for those that want to reach out to you, be part of what you got going on. Maybe they're interested in, in, in you know, um, delegating some of their money toward, you know, franchising and looking into this opportunity. How do they reach out to you and be part of what you got going on, Jamie? Yeah. I mean, the, the easiest way is through LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. You get me there. I'm also, I've got a, a public account on Instagram. Um, I actually do answer all the DMs and, and on all that stuff. So uh, you can reach out to me anyway. Again, simple, pretty simple. Awesome. And guys, those links will be in the description below. So make sure you stop what you're doing and make sure you consume that. If you're in, in any of those locations, make sure you go to Sweat House as well as Orange Theory and be part of his ecosystem. It is is amazing culture, synergistic, um, uh, you know, uh, arenas and, and studios. Jamie, again, I really appreciate you being on here big time. I always love to ask my guests before I let you go. Is there any last words of wisdom they'd like to share with our audience? Golly, uh, you don't have to wipe down your toilet paper before you use it. You're going to be just fine. COVID's not on the toilet paper. You're going to be fine. That's my only word of wisdom. Well said. Well said. Keep it simple, guys. That is executive chairman and founder of Honors Holding, my friend, Jamie Weeks. Guys, that is Journey with Christian Diamond's podcast. Until next time, be uncommon if you can. <laughs>